Well, one of our goals here at the conference is to have everybody network, and here I am going to interrupt your networking. My name is Will Durfee. I'm one of the conference organizers, and I'm uh, here to kind of kick off the uh, the second most important part of the lunch. The most important part being your 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 networking. Uh, uh, yesterday, I think Art said that uh, that this is the world's largest medical device conference of its kind, and we're going to continue to say that until proven otherwise. Uh, but but you know, there's some validity to that. We have uh, 1,100 registrants over the past three days. We had 48 sessions, 156 speakers, uh, well over 100 posters. So uh, pretty impressive numbers. So thanks to all of you who really were participating in and uh, making this uh, not not only a large conference, but in my mind, you know, a a really interesting and broad conference. So for example, in my sampling around of uh, the activities, I was finding about, about the mathematics of ultrasonic image-guided vascular interventions, all the way to the product design process at Kimberly-Clark, and the dimensional breadth. I was hearing about the molecular kinetics of the proteins that cause the migration of cancer cells, all the way up to the implications of terabytes of big data for cloud-based patient diagnostics. And then we just came from a really, I thought, thought-provoking window into the, the future of regulatory science. So I don't know about you, but uh, my head is kind of exploding with stuff, which I think is just a, a really good space um, to be. And there's, there's more to come, as we'll see in just a few minutes. And so what I'd like to do is to first uh, turn the podium over to uh, Jesus Cabrera, who's the Medical Device Innovation Fellow. And at the conference, he and just uh, Herder co-organized the three and five competition that many of you were at on uh, Wednesday morning. And he's here to present the awards of the winners. Thank you, Will. It's been a great opportunity to look at the presentations. The quality of the presentations that came in were outstanding, but I really want to applaud the presenters because what they did do and made my job so easy is they police themselves. One thing I wanted to do in this competition was have everyone have the same amount of time with their presentations and with the judges. And the presenters did that on their own, so I really appreciate it. It was a great job. I would love to say, we have three top winners that weren't ranked, that they stood out amongst the others. They didn't. It was a very close competition, and you guys should all be proud of yourselves. The first winner I'm going to present is Joshua Gafford. He did monolithic fabrication of millimeter scale uh, surgical devices with integrating sens uh, sensing. The next winner is Carl Nelson. He presented mobility enhancing fall prevention device for physical rehabilitation. Carl. And our final winner is Paxson Mater York, who's not here, and instead Alpern Demanger is going to um, pick up the certificate. This is the biologically inspired soft robot for thumb rehabilit rehabilitation. Thank you, Will. Thank you. And, and those of us who went to that uh, the competition yesterday, again, all, all the presentations were fabulous. And if I were an angel investor, I'd look very carefully at those three opportunities because I think all of us in the audience thought that each one of those three were, were pretty exciting. Um, 
Now we get to the, the heart of the activities for this afternoon, and I'm going to turn the podium over to Don Bardot, Senior Program Manager at the Medical Device Innovation Consortium. And while she um, comes up, I think we all owe her and Tina Morrison a round of applause for putting together the absolutely fabulous symposium that uh, we had this morning on regulatory science. So thank you, Don. Well, thank you very much, Will. It was a lot of fun and a little bit of stress. So today I have the pleasure of introducing uh, a friend and colleague who helps me with the social graces that, as an engineer, I sometimes lack. And Dana Boyle today is going to introduce our keynote speaker for lunch. Dana is the former Vice President of Community Engagement at Life Science Alley. Her work has been foundational in supporting our region's entrepreneurial community and in building connections between academics and business experts. Dana is also known for her leadership role in providing recognition and support to two women's professionals in Minnesota's life science communities through roundtables and special networking events. When she realized the critical need to draw the leaders from diverse backgrounds to solve the most pressing healthcare issues of our times, she focused on women leaders who seemed comfortable crossing the traditional barriers in order to be part of a collaborative dialogue. She is currently studying the effects of the multi generational workforce and con continues to speak on our best practices for building and leveraging strategic networks. If you'll help me welcome Dana Boyle. Now this year is a special year. For the first time we are inviting our luncheon keynote speaker at the end on our Thursday symposium as also our honoree, our Women in MedTech inaugural honoree. Ellen Strahan has been chosen as our honoree this year and it was just an absolutely wonderful opportunity that as we were planning the Regulatory Science Symposium and we recognized the influence of women in that particular symposium and then increasingly throughout the DMD conference, it was really an opportune time to recognize this component of our community that we previously hadn't been giving a direct recognition to. So with that, I'll allow Dana to take over. Yeah. Thank you, Don, and hello, everyone. Dr. Ellen Strahlman is the Senior Vice President of Research and Development and the Chief Medical Officer for Becton Dickinson and Company, one of the world's leading global medical technology companies, which is based in New Jersey and has um, it actually is in about 80 or 85 countries around the world. Dr. Strahlman, as you can see if you looked at your program, has deep experience in the fields of public health, biopharmaceuticals, and medical devices. She's been a champion and spokesperson for public health and world health issues, including HIV and blinding eye diseases. Dr. Strahlman is a graduate of Harvard University with a degree in biochemical sciences and applied mathematics. And she obtained her medical degree from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. She has med medical qualifications in general surgery and ophthalmology together with a master's degree in health sciences. Her corporate career includes leadership roles at GlaxoSmithKline, Merck, Novartis, Pfizer, and Bausch and & Lohm. And as part of her role at Beckton Dickinson, or BD, Dr. Strauman also heads up corporate strategic innovation, which makes her an especially appropriate speaker to address this audience at the Design and Medical Devices Conference. Colleagues describe her as innovative, data-driven, and inclusive, and she is known as an aspiring leader who focuses unwaveringly on how to truly make things better for patients. In fact, one of her hallmarks is to say to her colleagues, there's a patient at the end of everything that we do. When we spoke with people who have worked beside her, uh, what really sets Dr. Strawman apart is her personal leadership style. She is known as a steward of others. When she sees good work, she looks for ways to be additive and to leverage what others are already doing well in order for them to take it to the next level. This facet of her leadership and her energy level, which you'll see, are contagious within the BD culture, and her collaborative management style has been seen in the redesign of BD's organizational structure, where their senior R&D and medical affairs leaders in medical, diagnostics, and biosciences now all report up through her. The value of this new alignment is a more integrated R&D and medical affairs vision that is even more patient-centered. 
And in speaking to Dr. Strawman, we learned that one of her proudest professional accomplishments is having helped to create Vive Healthcare, a profitable and charitable venture between Pfizer and GlaxoSmithKline, which is dedicated to treating patients suffering from HIV wherever they may live. And it's a great example of doing well by doing good. And so we are delighted to honor Dr. Ellen Strawman here today. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I'm very humbled to be here, actually, because I, I had a chance to actually, I, so I have not attended the conference until today. But not only have I looked at the program, but I did actually go online and see some of the papers. And what you guys are doing, what you've accomplished, the winners that were just announced, is very inspiring to me. And I do think, I really am very, I guess you talked to some people before I got here, so thank you for all those kind words. Um, but I have never filed a patent. I have never invented anything myself. And so I'm here in a, in a kind of a different, different capacity because I hope to share with you, give you some ideas about what it's like not only to be a person who can do those things, but to inspire others to work together to solve problems. And I do have a number of slides. I hope you'll be able to um, listen to all of them. But I got some advice a number of years ago from a, from, a, from a colleague who said, you know, when you stand up and you give people 30 slides, you know, they're, not gonna, they're only going to remember three things. So I thought I'd tell you the three things I'd like you to remember perhaps after I, I share a few words um, in the next half hour or so. So the three things are convergence, partnership, and a personal mission. Those three things have been, if I had to think about what has made me do the things that have happened over the last 20 years or so, it's those ideas that come together that have put me on the path that led me to some of the work that I'm doing today. So let me see if I can, again, with the equipment here. So I'll start, I guess, a little bit with the personal mission. So you heard Dana say that I did start my life as a mathematician, um, but I always knew I wanted to be a physician. It was just something, my father says I was born like that, but I think he stood over my crib and said, become a doctor, you know, become a doctor. And as I was training in medicine, um, even as I was learning surgery and ophthalmology, I got very inspired by the ideas of public health because having be, becoming a physician in the early 1980s, like so many other people, I was caught up in the HIV epidemic. This was a global epidemic sweeping developed un, and developing countries alike, striking down young people in the prime of life. And it was a very compelling proposition to be working on. And a fascinating thing happened to me um, while I was working at NIH. So I was at the NIH. I was actually working, you know, doing some work in ophthalmology and clinical trial design. And Tony Fauci organized um, a special task force. People from the FDA were there from the NIH and from academic medicine. And the purpose of this coming together, of this partnership, was the convergence of an idea that we could bring medicines to patients faster because people were dying. And the regulatory pathway for medicines, for those of you who are familiar with the pharmaceutical industry, particularly in the 60s and 70s, it took many years for a medicine to come to the market. And the idea was that we were going to need medicines faster because this disease was spreading like wildfire. And so that group laid the foundation for what eventually became the FDA expedited regulatory pathway for the, for the, for the fast approval of medicines. And it's very fitting that I tell this story in the Regulatory Science Symposium. Um, because you'll hear later that it is through networks and consortia and partnership that these things get done. And the big idea here was could we bring medicines to patients faster? There was a convergence of the science, a convergence of societal interest, and a convergence of the regulators to want to do this in a safe and effective way, but faster than before that led to this. And it was that work that really led me to industry because a few, actually while I was working um, on that task force, um, I was asked to interview for a job at Merck 
um, where I would have the opportunity to work on delivering medicines for blinding eye disease, for HIV, and also participate in a global health program. So some of you who know global health know that Merck has now for 27 years given away ivermectin for the treatment of onchocerciasis, and, um, which is river blindness in Africa. And Roy Vagelos went every year to his board to ask for the money to do this. It was his conviction that he would do that until the disease was gone. And so even though, for those of you who are in academia here, I went over to the dark side of industry in those days, I felt I could work for a company that was willing to do well by doing good. And Merck was such a company. You see that I have worked for quite a few companies over the last 23 years. And I'm very proud now to work at BD, where it is also such a company. So it was that story that brought me to industry and really led to something that I think has become kind of a personal mission for me. So Merck was founded uh, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, George Merck being one of the founders. And when he gave this address at the Medical College of Virginia to medical students in 1957, he basically said that if we find the medicines to help people, the money will follow. And for all of you here, it doesn't have to be medicine. In fact, it's far more than the drugs that makes a difference in people's lives. It can be any dimension of healthcare, whether it is a new thumb, you know, a robot, um, a delivery device for drugs, all the things that, that people are working on to make the world a better place. And it's what's led me to my kind of personal theme of thinking that there's a patient at the end of everything we do. And this is something that has really been a personal mission for me for some years. So you saw in the background that I've worked for lots of different companies and I'm often asked, you know, how does this work? I mean, how do you play for this many teams without ever really switching sides? And I think, you know, having refined this mission over the years, you know, to bring health care to people and to also bring value for the business, and we'll talk about why in a moment, and include the whole world in that work. That's actually something that really gets me out of bed every day. Um, it's something I share often with my colleagues at BD and other places I've worked. And for, for many who work in the healthcare industry, it's why they come to work as well. So sometimes what you can do is put into words for people what they think for themselves, and that, that helps um, guide the conversation. So what brought me to that, to BD, was exactly these ideas. And you see some of these um, things here, and I am shamelessly pitching for BD, so those of you who think you might want a career at our fabulous company, um, you can get my information <laughs> after you leave here today. But B Beckton Dickinson is a company that delivers high quality, affordable and profitable products and devices and machines to, pay, to people and patients, healthcare workers, and biomedical researchers all over the world. They have an intentional investment in innovation, and I have the privilege of leading that practice for the company. And it leverages also products they make with its future to provide solutions for people. We are a global company, and we have many programs in global health. Um, and it, you know, so we do include the whole world in our work. And we have great people, great, great values, and also great leadership. So my colleagues at the leadership level at BD have the values um, that we all share. And I just want to show you this timeline because we are especially proud of this. I mean, BD is a, is a company that has done many things for the first time. So you, what you, uh, there's one story that I'll tell you. You see lots of firsts here. But when the Salk vaccine many years ago had to be tested, there was no such thing as a disposable glass syringe for a vaccine. BD not only made this, but provided it at cost for that clinical trial. When George Bush started the PEPFAR program, BD was the first industry partner to help provide flow cytometers and other products for people suffering with AIDS. So this is a company, and the other thing about BD is it's what's known on Wall Street as a blue chip aristocrat. For the last 40 years, they have raised the dividend every year, not dramatically, but a little bit all the time. So the company's well run, it makes money, and it has, um, it has the values of also delivering back to society. So it's a wonderful place to work and the best decision I ever made um, in, 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 in choosing a job. And I'll just, again, 
I, I said, this is my commercial. BD is well recognized as an ethical company, a steward of the environment, um, a company where, a great where it is a great place to work. And of course, my dream, now that I've been BD, at BD just about a year, is someday that we can be one of the most innovative companies. So if you have good ideas, BD is a great place to come and work. But let's talk now in a more general way about the contribution of the healthcare industry to society. And I'd like to set us up with a couple of ideas. I deeply believe that there's a convergence of the interests of society and the interests of healthy business because the goals are the same. When people are happy and prosperous, they contribute and do well, not only for each other, um, but for the world at large. And I write here now, if not now, when? Because there's never been a better time. I mean, the advancements in science and medicine and technology are at, to such a point, we can do things that we've never, we couldn't even dream of before. Um, a very mundane example, you know, I grew up in the, in the sort of tri-state area of New York, of New York City, and when I was a student trying to commute, and waiting on the long lines um, you know, to get through the toll booths of the uh, Long Island Expressway, I said, someday they're gonna, gonna be put, they're gonna put something on my windshield so I can just go through the toll barrier. Now, those of you who are familiar with the Easy Pass know that this has been a reality now for more than a dozen years. And that's just driving your car. All of you in this room know about the advancements in technologies, things we can do that we've never done before, and applying those to the health and well-being of society we have an unprecedented opportunity. So let's talk about why the convergence of business and society makes so much sense. Many of you are aware of the, of the United Nation, of the WHO's Millennium, Millennium Development Goals. The WHO and the United Nations set these goals at the millennium and they were basically designed to raise the standard of health and well-being for the world at large. Now, what you may not know is about five years into this, in 2005, we were really behind on millennial goals four and five, reducing childhood mortality rates and improving maternal health. And the main reason we were behind is that there were quite a few countries in Southeast Asia and Africa who had been burdened by financial debt. So eight ministers of finance from, one of, from, the G, from the G20 countries of the world actually got together and forgave nearly $100 million in debt with the promise from those governments that that would be reinvested in these programs. So why would they do that? Well, the finance ministers of the G8 or 20 or whatever your favorite number is actually meet every year um, at, the Devo, at, the, at Davos for the World Economic Forum. Um, a meeting that you may have heard about in the news from time to time. And I apologize for the small print on this slide, but what you see here, and this was a couple of years ago, but it really doesn't, hasn't really changed much. These are an outline of the risks to society. You know, because the finance, financial ministers are very interested in all kinds of risk, whether it could be from the environment, geopolitical instability. But what you also see here is that health and well-being are five or six of the key risks that are likely and high on the impact scale. So it's in the best interests of countries. They actually see that even from a financial perspective for their societies to be healthy and well. And WHO follows with this. So what you see here, and this is only goes to 2002, so this number is over 500 now. WHO has expanded what they call the essential medicines list over the last 20 or 30 years. And part of the reason for that is actually to drive the adoption of healthcare treatment to people all over the world. A lot of this is made possible by the fact that many medicines have gone off patent in the last 10 or 15 years. Now that's not necessarily so good for the stock of pharmaceutical companies, but it's of tremendous benefit to mankind. And in fact, this genericization of medicine actually brings med tech and pharma much closer together because when medicines are at an affordable price, then getting them to people, whether you swallow a pill, pill or have an IV infusion, whether you need devices or otherwise, is a great opportunity. 
And so the healthcare industry can contribute to these solutions, even as the G8 finance ministers did and the WHO does. And they do that in a variety of ways. Companies actually create business structures to, be, to enable this. They invest in R&D, and of course there are the humanitarian programs like the one at Merck um, that was started so many years ago. There's a short list of what some companies are doing. Um, Novartis um, has, a, has a great program in India. Grameen, um, the same company that brought you uh, microfinance, has a, health, has, a, has a health organization now. And I do want to say a few words about Vive Healthcare that Dana mentioned to you earlier. So this was one of the nicest examples and very heartfelt example for me um, in my career. That Pfizer and GSK got together to form a company specifically devoted to HIV. The medicines do make money, but look what you see here. For medicines that don't honor patents, the company has granted 28 voluntary, what they call voluntary licenses. In other words, you can still have the medicines anyway. So if you are making generics in that company, we will help you sell them. And in fact, the company also helps for quality control. There is something called an advanced market commitment. Now, I don't know how, do any, do, are, any, are people familiar with this? So an advanced market commitment means if it's expensive to make a drug, funding organizations will come together and actually promise governments loans and grants to buy the medicines so that a company can invest in making them. And this is, and this is really built off vaccine work. So you know that vaccines are pretty expensive to make. It can cost $600 million to, to even make a plant for a vaccine. So if you don't, if there isn't a market to sell them into, for all the good in the world, it would be pretty irresponsible for a business to make them. Well, the Gavi Alliance actually guarantees, helps guarantee funding and pricing so that immunizations can occur all over the world. And Vive Healthcare in, instituted this for HIV. The Positive Action Fund donates medicines and services, particularly for children with HIV. And that's just some of the things that this company does. It's one example. I share this one with you because it's one I know well, but there are many others. Investing in R&D is very important, and here again I'll talk to you about what Becton Dickinson is doing in global health. So in addition to making products that we sell all over the world, we now have a new global health business devoted specifically to maternal and child health. And you can hear more about that if you, or read about it if you'd like to look at our website. But what I want to talk to you about is look at all the people we have as partners. And the idea that you work in partnership to achieve your goals, leverage the convergence of interests, this is very important to us, um, particularly in delivering health care to patients. And finally, in terms of donations, um, almost Almost all the pharmaceutical companies nowadays participate in donating medicines, and particularly for the neglected tropical diseases. I had the good fortune to be in the audience when um, Bill Gates actually announced with Margaret Chan of the WHO the London Declaration for NTDs. 15 pharmaceutical companies donating medicines for the elimination of more than 20 NTDs in the next 20 years. It's kind of a 20-20-20 guarantee. Um, and again, this is the first time companies have participated together at this level. So I'm running through a lot of examples here, but I hope it gives you some inspiration for what it's like to work in companies that are purpose-driven, that have good values, and that want to include the whole world in their work. So why do we need innovation? And I think, again, looking through your program today, I'm, I'm going to be, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here because these are things you know well. But perhaps I could give you the perspective from, from a medical point of view. So what's happened even in, my, in our lifetime since I was trained in medicine, we've seen HIV go from a death sentence to a chronic disease, and many cancers the same. Infections are now diagnosed and treated at the point of care. Years ago, you'd have to wait or guess. And I see a lot of young people in the audience, so I'm gonna, now we have a little audience participation. How many of you know someone who's had a heart attack? Can I hear, have a show of hands? 
Okay. Now keep your hands up, if you don't mind. This is kind of this is now a hard question. How many of you, for the people that you know, did people leave this world? How many people died from that heart attack? Okay, so there are about 10 or 15 percent of the hands still up. And when I trained in medicine, that number was 60 percent. And so the reason for that is not just medicine and it's not just statins. It's actually the fact that most people in developed countries live within 100 miles of a coronary care unit. So there's an entire system of care, medicines, machines, devices, catheters, all those things that help people stay healthy if they have heart trouble. The last thing I want to mention is, again, this is on the partnership theme, consortium funding. I've described a few things. When I trained in medicine, 17% of the world's children were vaccinated for childhood diseases. That number is now north of 85%, and that's due to philanthropy and consortium funding because those countries, unfortunately, aren't a whole lot wealthier. But the reach of the WHO through the Gavi Alliance and the United Nations to deliver vaccines, you see this and you see it now for neglected tropical diseases. So for all the things that we have solved in the last 25 years, the challenges ahead are even more formidable. So there are more people alive today over the age of 65 than ever existed before. And for the first time in human history, in the developing world, more people will leave us due to chronic disease than from infections. And by the way, the infections are still there. It's just what else has come with it. For the first time in history also, more people are overweight than starving, and diabetes is a global pandemic, and it's a terrible disease for those of you who know people or um, uh, suffer from it. And for all of that, patients want to be treated at home. They don't want to go to the hospital. And that is a big shift all over the world. There'll be seven billion of us, and most of us will be living in Asia. So there is no area of medicine or global health where there isn't profound need. And we can participate in solving those problems. So how can we do that through regulatory science? Um, this is a description of kind of the realities of what it actually means to get, to, to, to get health care to patients. So it's not enough to, have the, to just be a little bit quicker, smarter, or slicker with a device, or just a little bit better with a drug. Whatever you do, actually, you have to demonstrate an outcome and a benefit for patients. You have to generate the evidence to be able to do that. And then there are certain things that are almost impossible to study properly but we actually know they're important. So for example, you know, how many of you know, if any of you are taking chronic medications, would you rather take your pill once a day or three times a day? Well, of course you'd rather take it once a day. But a generic medicine that you have to take three times a day is probably a lot cheaper. So if we had to ask the FDA or the EMA or the China FDA to allow us to put a couple of medicines together so you can take them once a day, or actually have a drug device combination so that, so that it would be easier to administer medications, or a variety of things. Generating that evidence and understanding it is very, very important. So we need health economics. We actually need to satisfy our regulators, who, by the way, have the same goals we do. And Macroeconomic uncertainties, the fact is no, people, you know, the cost of medical care is only going up. So things we do for the developing world at low cost, that'll come back here to us and to our, you know, and, and to people in Europe who also are looking to contain costs. So there isn't an open check to do this, but people are getting older and will need care. So in light of all those things, regular, regulatory science has a role to play. The story I told you when I first opened about how the FDA and the NIH and academia got together for the expedited clinical pathway. I can tell you, um, I know that there may be some colleagues from FDA in the audience, I've had a wonderful experience working with the FDA for more than 20 years when we actually show up and talk about the science because the goals are the same. So don't always come with a dossier in your hand, come with an idea and science to back it up, and a willingness to actually invest whether you're going to get a product out of it or not. 
I've had a lot of success, and my teams have over the years, and that is absolutely the approach we need. And it's more than companies. We need partners in every, every part of society to help to help align on those efforts. Again, you have, a, you have a list here of why it's important, but I think even intuitively you can see that without the evidence, without agreement on the goals, without working together, it's gonna to be very hard to get these things done. Um, I've given you a couple of examples of where we see some interest in the medical device field. There are examples in pharmaceuticals. Um, but we can't actually just expect, because we think it's a good idea whether you be a doctor or an innovator or a researcher, you actually have to have the science and the evidence behind that. And helping to define that with our colleagues at the regulatory agencies is key. So the future, and I want to just please, I, I, I want to um, just in a way thank the colleagues at MDIC who play a tremendous role in helping us in the med tech field and, and BD is a proud member you know, of the board of MDIC. But what they have set forth in terms of the ambition to actually get, get products to patients is, um, is not only, are not only things we can aspire to, but it's how they do the work. It's multiple stakeholder engagement. It's defining goals. It's actually applying science to the solutions to these problems and working with partners to get it done. And that's what we are gonna see more and more of. We talk about it today like it's a new idea, but more than 20 years ago, it was an idea that made a lot of sense and a tremendous amount got done. So we have some important progress. Again, I'm gonna put my little pitch in here for diagnostics reform, but I would say stay tuned. We're working on this um, with our partners and I, I think it will be of great benefit. And I really wanna close by, by going back to the three things that I talked about before. So I hope you can tell by not only what I've said, but how I've said it, that you know, for me, getting healthcare for patients is the personal mission that has guided me through my career. And I hope you could see by the examples that I gave that without partners, or the other side of it, by working together, um, we can actually achieve more than any single organization can do on its own. But finally, and then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, there's a tremendous convergence of our interests. Um, if you are the steward of safe and effective products, which is what our regulatory authorities do for our society, if you are an inventor and you want to change the world for the better with a product or an idea or a medicine for people, and if you are a business that wants to not only contribute to the workforce by hiring people, but also get great products and medicines and vaccines to people, those interests converge for the same thing, to help all people live healthy lives. This is BD's mission, but it's also a great mission for all of us in biomedical research. So I'll close with those ideas, and I really want to thank the MDIC and Life Alley for allowing me to be here today, and for all of you, your kind attention. Thank you. So Ellen, thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> it's our inaugural Women in MedTech Honoree Award. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much again. <laughs>I reminded you about questions because I have a question, sir. Okay. Um, I, I want to, uh, first, a fantastic talk. Thank, thank you very much. Very, very inspiring. Um, as, as you look, you said that one of your goals is to uh, make BD even more of an innovative company than it is now. And maybe if you could um, share with us just uh, maybe a little bit about how one goes about doing that. Okay. Well, so there's a couple of ways to do that. So first of all, um, you have to, you actually... Um, I guess my favorite, my, the favorite way to open when I answer this question is that, uh, are you familiar with Sutton's Law? Willie Sutton? So you know he was a famous bank robber. And people used to say, Willie, why do you rob banks? 
And he said, well, that's where the money is. So the fact is, you actually, you've got to put some money into this. I mean, and I say this at first because, um, you know, so um, I have the good fortune to be the leader of R&D at, 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 at uh, Becton Dickinson. And I always tell people that if you're an R&D leader, you are the best salesman in the company or saleswoman because you have to ask for money long before the revenues turn up. So you better be very persuasive. What we've done at BD is we have intentionally moved significant funding for new products. So now almost a third of the R&D budget is dedicated to what we call our outside the home court or the things that are beyond our core business. And so in the last three years, we have actually shifted the funding. So that's the first thing. And I, I, I mention money first because, you know, talk is cheap until the money shows up. But now the, the, but the money has been there and we are investing, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that we have also seen the results. So the, our revenues from new sales have actually basically gone from 7 or 8% and they'll be north of 15% in 2014. So this is really great for my board because, you know, now we actually say this is really working, guys, so we can keep doing it. And the third thing is we had just launched earlier this week at BD. Um, we now have um, a construct we're calling the Office of Science, Medicine, and Technology. Today it's an internal website. We will be taking it external. And we are, we are basically, if I had a sign here and I had my chief operating officer, Bill Cozy, with me, I would say we are open for business. So we are buying companies, we are partnering, we are looking for inventions um, to invest in. BD Technologies in North Carolina, where some of our colleagues work, um, will be starting an incubator in the next year. So we're actually doing a series of things to foster innovation. We haven't done that in the past. Um, and it's, so that's really what we're looking forward to. So if you have ideas, if, you're, if you actually have a chance to Un, look, know a little bit about what BD is about. Inventors, um, biotech companies, and also partners um, where we're looking for you. I mean, that's maybe a short way of saying it, but that's how we know that it's going to be different. And in five years, I hope I'm back here telling you about it. And maybe some of you who actually presented, you know, pre presented over the last couple of days, if you're looking for a company to develop your ideas, you know, we're open for business. So as your customers in the health systems are trying to move from volume-based medicine to value-based medicine, do companies like BD have a role in helping them make that shift, or is that something that really needs to happen internally within the health systems themselves? So um, the answer is both. So, so I think so, so let me just, uh, let me try to characterize that. So the fact is, Inside our own company, it's not just good enough, like I said a few minutes ago, we can't just make the next slicker thing because it looks good or it might be a little smaller or, you know, or it'll cost us less money to make. If we want to sell it, we actually have to generate evidence as to why it matters. And on the other side, a health system has, has, has to be willing to say, well, that, that actually counts for something. So for example, if we, so you, so you actually have to apply science to both ends. So it's no longer sufficient to innovate without an, without an understanding of what the outcome will be. Um, and that has to be thought of from the moment you design the product. So inside the company, we have to really shift, you know, in terms of what we do. From the healthcare system side, it's very easy to look at the hard outcomes. You know, those are the easy ones. You know, death, stroke, you know, things you can measure. Patient reported outcomes, biomarkers, other things that really matter to patients and harder to, uh, harder to capture. Health systems, you know, healthcare systems have to think about why that can matter to patients and be, be willing to at least hear the arguments. But more importantly, it's, it's very important to work to actually define that science together. So, for example, some of our customers are payers, and you know they don't want they don't want their you know they don't want their constituents they don't want their patients back in the hospital. So sometimes when we're thinking about products design, we actually are thinking about how it might help patients to go home sooner. But we have to invest in generating that evidence. And by the way, if we want it on our label, we better talk to the FDA because they have a view on this. 
The other thing is that we might have an idea that we could make a new product and it might be easier to use. Human factors, there's been a lot at this conference about that, right? Well, generating that evidence in a way that really matters to patient, that's reliable and reproducible, there's a, there's a lot going on, but making sure that science is really airtight, um, that we, we, have a, we have a ways to go there. So I think it's, it's investment in both sides and also advancing in the understanding for the outcomes for patients. One of the aspects of innovation is that oftentimes the first generation of a product is not um, fully um, refined, if you will. And so and, and when you're going into a healthcare system and one of the unique things from medical devices, if you will, versus say your pharmaceutical experience is that there is a learning curve for the healthcare providers as well. And so there's no, not only the innovation curve within the company and selling it, if you will, within the company, but I, I'm wondering if you have a perspective coming from you know, the pharmaceutical industry to devices where you also have to sell the providers that this is going to be beneficial for them as well. Yeah, so I do, and, and I do, I will say, um, I, most, much of my career has been in pharma. I did have the privilege of working at Bausch and Loam for five years, um, trying to teach people how to put a contact lens in. Now that is an interesting experience. Um, for those of you who wear contact lenses, there's probably not as many people in the audience as old as I am, but in the old days, when the contact lenses were hard plastic, they were pretty easy. Soft plastic's a lot more comfortable, and try getting it into your eye. So I, yes, so I just, that, I couldn't resist. I'm an ophthalmologist, right? You're gonna hear something about that. But it is, in fact, I actually believe it's the obligation of a company to train people. And we do a lot of that at BD. So um, when we think about devices, we think about the end user. So if, if, whether it's the healthcare provider, or the physician, or ultimately even the patient, um, and, and our, I won't say, it's not, it's not a sales force, but we have kind of a, a, a service that we offer laboratories and then also we train healthcare workers all over the world in using our products. So they, I think if you're going to develop products with the end user in mind, as a company you have to make that investment and, and, I, and I, I just don't see any way around that. It's something that we do. Um, I know that there are other companies um, here in the room and I know they do the same. That has to be figured into the cost of what you do. Um, and I would say neglect it at your peril because if people can't use your products, and we used to say in pharma that if no one takes the medicine, it doesn't matter how good it is. Well, if no one uses your product, it won't help anyone. So that must be considered and it's something that we, we actually take time to think about and invest in ourselves. Hi, Ellen. I'm Tina Morrison. I'm uh, at FDA, actually, oh, and okay. working in uh, computational modeling and simulation, actually trying to move that effort forward in regulatory science. And what well, you did a great job was, was describing these different types of partnerships that you've been involved in and emphasizing the need for partnerships. And what I'm curious about is how do you, you know, it's um, interesting to bring people in a room together and even allow some companies to say, we'll even put up some money to be a part of this. How do you actually, or what has been your experience in getting them to, to do more than that, to actually take the next step and trusting that all the others in the room really have converged on this idea of you know, advancing regulatory science with modeling and simulation, for example? How, how do you build that trust that everyone's gonna move forward together? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of, I wish I could give you a few general statements, Tina, but it's been kind of different every time. So uh, I'll get, I have another quote from a, from a dear friend of mine, uh, Fiona Godley, who was the editor-in-chief of the British Medical Journal. So in the great British style, she often convenes people around the table to at least get that conversation started. And she actually taught me something a number of years ago that I think would, is extremely useful in these situations. Every person in the room, if you have various constituencies around the table, Everyone somewhere has an irreducible conflict of interest. That, that moment comes, it is absolutely there. Pretending it's not theirs is the worst thing you can do. So actually getting, if you can generate enough trust to get that on the table first, okay, then people are looking at each other and say, okay, you know, we're a business and if we don't make a profit, no one's gonna invest in this. And you know, at FDA, I, mean, you, I don't even have to tell, I'm not gonna make up what you guys would say because you know what you would say. And then we have patient advocacy, we have all kinds of things. So then those things are out there. 
If you can, then, think about the problem you want to solve and the good it would do. That's always the way that we, we actually get people talking. And I think those, those, those two things are what I try to do first. You know, and it's not just signing your conflict of interest statement and showing it to everybody, but really saying, you know, being able to say, guys, this is a great idea, and you know, tell me how I convinced my board to spend that money. You know, actually helping getting some ammunition, actually. So I think that really laying the issues on the table, not only the problem to solve, but to really be honest about where the conflicts may lie. And then, you know, um, Jimmy Carter was always very fond of saying, then you take step by step to discern mutual interest and take the steps that would, would satisfy, you know, both sides or five sides or, or whatever. It doesn't always work. I wish I could say it did. It doesn't always work. Sometimes you just can't, can't get past something. But um, I think that those are some of the ideas behind it. The other thing is honestly time. You really have to spend time with people. And then I'll say really what I said in the talk. Again, if you, if you actually believe in something and you want to have a conversation, and especially now I speak for people in industry, show up when you actually don't have a reason you want to make money. Right? So the, in other words, the product, you don't want the product approved in the next year. The product may be five years away, but it's an idea and it's a worthy problem. It's, people are, are, you know, they have more trust in you if you're actually willing to put your time and your effort and your money into solving it um, before it's going to be of benefit to you. So just some thoughts after trying to do this for these many years. So it seems to me a very unique role to be chief medical officer and then also senior vice president of R&D. It's um, some different function lines. What types of activities do you do or, or do you try to integrate the two? And sometimes there's a mutual tension between the <clears throat> regulatory side and the developer side and um, well we wanted the de developers wanting to just iterate a little bit more and the regulars needing design freeze and what kind of things do you do to attack that? Well yeah there's some good tension. I'm seeing some nods in the front of the room here you know so it's, I sort of feel like I want to put that shirt on that says been there done there and got the t-shirt. Well the thing is that you know if you're and again no matter how I say this, this isn't going to come out right so bear with me you can make the perfect design, okay, and if you haven't checked with your medical colleagues that like any patient or nurse would actually use it, it's really not going to help. And they know because they're there in the operating room doing this or whatever it is they're doing. So part of bringing medical and R&D together in our company is to make sure that we do that check. Because you know what it's like, you have a great idea, it starts somewhere and then by the time you, if you keep it only in your own brain or only in your own discipline or only in your own silo, you can miss something really important. So that's the first thing. In terms of, I mean, I guess I've always believed and, and I have had the privilege of having several roles that combine medical and R&D. If you do always think about the end user, even from the very beginning, and in fact, we haven't started this at BD yet, but I hope to do it because I've done it in other places. I've rotated people on both sides so that the doctors who think they know it all, and I can say that for the medical profession, have you ever met a, put 10 doctors in a room with 20 opinions and they're all right? Yeah, you've, seen, you've heard this, right? So let them be the person to say, will we stop the design now? And they look around and say, well, I could do this, you know, you just put, you, you know, putting people in the other people's shoes is a very good way to actually get some of that done. So we do it to make sure we broaden the perspective, to make sure that we actually don't miss anything important. And of course what we do goes way beyond medical and R&D, you know, that's kind of an engine for the company, but we, we have to check beyond that. So it's kind of, it reminds me of the question I was just asked, you know, constituencies even inside the company, you know, making sure that, that people can you know maybe lay their biases on the table, but try to work together to solve a better common problem. But nothing, nothing is best than being in the, having some experience on the other side. So it, it, that's that's part of what we try to do. 
So, so I'm standing up because I'm going to ask the last question because we have to shut down uh, pretty soon. But in, in the audience, we have uh, many students, graduates and undergraduates, and men and women, and they've been uh, key contributors and participating and interacting. But the reason why they're all here is they all have a deep interest in healthcare, and many of them want to get into the healthcare industry. And right now, many of them are saying, "I want to be just like Ellen." <laughs> so, if um, I wonder what kind of advice you might want to give them for what's the next step that they should do? Well, um, so I hope you don't, I hope that isn't true, but I hope you want to do it because there are things you want to do yourself. Um, the next step, well, I will tell you, I'm, I'm, I know I speak for BD, um, but all the companies in the room would feel the same. We are out recruiting for you guys, so if we haven't shown up on your campus yet, we would. Um, and certainly in this electronic age, you can, you can actually get onto websites and do things. But nothing inspires a company more to hire you than to actually think about, and I guess go back to this personal mission thing, what problems you want to solve and what you would contribute to the company to solve it. And by the way, if you, anyone who wants to hire you is going to ask you that question. So specific steps, I would say, um, you know, be aggressive in reaching out. Um, you know, at our end, we'll certainly respond. You know, I think um, the other thing I would say is really don't be afraid of doing something different because it's not an obvious thing to go into industry. And then I guess from my own personal experience, one thing, and I, you know, this may not work for everybody, you, do, you have to be willing to move. So if you want to sort of live 10 miles from where you grew up or went to school and never go anyplace else, it's going to be hard because the industry is all over the world. If you have a chance to work in Asia, do it. I mean, that is, I mean, that's advice. Um, I actually, one of my children is in, is in Asia at the moment um, working. So that's something I would give, uh, that's advice I'd give to this generation of students. And, and really, and don't give up. I mean, there's a lot, we're, we are looking for talented people. You know, you're, the future is here in this room for how we're gonna solve all these problems. So I hope that's helpful. All right, please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you.